tornadoes have been knocking those poles out. That's right. Sorting. 
Uh, it can go in the truck together. The truck driver doesn't have to do any sorting, and it comes to our facility. And because of this new investment, new technology, that material is then separated at the facility and and then processed and shipped tipped to market. Paper mills, plastics processors, metals processors, what have you. Um, that investment again was private investment. Uh, creates dozens of new jobs right here in Southfield. That it improves the recycling process. It allows us to take more materials and expand recycling. Uh, it makes the collection more efficient, uh, and it reduces the uh, sorting requirements for the residents, makes it more convenient for them, and allows us also to transition from the old 18-gallon bins to curbside carts. And we have some examples of those curbside carts in the back of the room there. Uh, there's two sizes back there, a 64-gallon cart and a 96-gallon cart. Those carts are wheeled carts that make it much easier for <coughs> residents to recycle because they can just throw all their stuff in the cart and wheel it to the curb. Uh, they'll recycle so much more, they'll probably be able to get rid of a trash can. Uh, and studies show that when residents have these carts, they do recycle a lot more because it's logical. If you have a small 18-gallon bin, once that's full, you're generally going to just throw the rest of the stuff in the trash can. Uh, what this does is it makes it much easier because you can just keep filling that cart up and and uh, you know, once it's full on your regular trash day, you wheel it to the curb. You have an existing contract with waste management uh, for curbside services, and that's for trash collection, yard waste collection, and recycling collection. That contract went into effect uh, in October of 2008 as a result of a publicly bid uh, contract solicitation. Waste management, which, by the way, is the number one service provider in the country and has been serving Southfield uh, for many, many years and is located here in Southfield was the low bidder. They were low, the low bidder by about 31 percent. Uh, so they were, they were low bidder by quite a, quite a margin. Uh, there's a provision in that contract that allows the city to tell waste management that they can move from collecting the material dual stream, and again that's where the papers are separated from the, the bottles and cans, to single stream collection. And that's a, that's a specification in your contract that you have the right to tell them to begin collecting single stream. It'll make it easier for your residents and they, they can collect it more efficiently. So when this new retrofit was completed, uh, you know, the investment by Reed Community, our partner there to, at the Recycling Center, uh, on behalf of all of our cities that are serviced by waste management, which is Southfield, Farmington, Farmington Hills, and Wixom, we went to them and said, we've got this specification in the contract. We want to move from the dual stream collection to the single stream collection effective January 1st. But we also are interested in knowing what kind of uh, conditions you would provide us if we were to also ask you to provide the city with these curbside collection carts, moving away from the curbside bin to the curbside carts. Uh, and again, that makes it easier for the residents and allows them to recycle more. And again, studies show that recycling generally will increase about 40 <coughs> percent. So, so we asked them to give us a proposal to move the carts, and, and, and what was the, what were the conditions that would be necessary? Um, waste management came back to us and they said, "We can do that. We can provide the carts at no cost to the city." And as Jim mentioned, these are these are Michigan-made carts, made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, we can provide those carts. Um, and we can deploy the new curbside collection vehicles, the automated collection vehicles, uh, but we need a contract extension to do so uh, because we're talking about a capital investment and we need to amortize it over uh, a longer period of time than what's left on the existing contract. So they made a proposal to, to, to Rossock uh, on behalf of, uh, for the cities to <coughs> lower your existing contract costs within the term of the existing contract, which currently would go through 2016. <coughs> Uh, lower your fuel surcharge costs, and that would result in about $50,000 worth of savings a year. So it's about uh, 2 to 3 percent cost savings. They would, they would provide the cars at no cost to the city. It would eliminate the city having to manage the replacement bins. Uh, right now the city buys replacement bins every year as people lose them or they, they, they um, move out of the city and take them with them or they break or they want a second bin or whatever you, the city, the city manages that. Uh, that would be replaced by waste management taking full responsibility for replacing those carts if they're lost or damaged. Uh, and it would also uh, cause you ha to have an increase in recycling, which would probably be uh, 
the total savings between your savings and your increased recycling would be about $73,000 a year that would be the net <coughs> savings under the new provisions. And it would also allow the city to, uh, the waste manager to move within the city to compress natural gas vehicles, which are quieter, lighter on your roads, and it would reduce any fuel costs, uh, surcharge costs that you may have in the future. And they could talk more about their commitment to, to doing that if, if the contract is extended um, as proposed. Um, this was reviewed by the Rossock Board of Directors and it was unanimously endorsed uh, and, and that's why it's, it's here tonight. Uh, we we want to roll this out to the cities for their consideration. Uh, and it really the Rossock Board look at it quite simply. It's going to reduce cost, improve service to the residents, and improve program performance. And based on those three considerations, it, it, the board felt that it merited a contract extension. Uh, if, if the council sees fit to approve the contract amendment, um, what we would do as, as, as an entity, Rossock, we would engage in a public c campaign uh, to let the residents know about the new cards and about the new materials that can go in them. And, and uh, as I told uh, uh, one of our uh, one of your fellow communities recently, uh, by the time the residents actually get the cards, it would be a surprise to nobody. We'd engage, we'd work with Cable 15 and the press, and we'd do a direct mailer and work with the Department of Public Works so that they know what to expect and what's coming, and they'd be prepared when they got the new cards. And experience shows us across Michigan and across the country that the cards are pretty well received, uh, actually overwhelmingly received. They, they are the trend. You'll find more and more people, more and more communities rather moving away from the curbside bin, moving these larger carts uh, in, in southeast Michigan, you know, within the, the past several months and years, Rochester Hills, Taylor, Westland, uh, North Hill, a number of communities have moved in that direction and you'll continue to see that. It is a trend because it's more efficient for the residents, it's more convenient for the residents, and it's a more efficient for your hauler, which is why they can pass along some cost savings under the current contract. <coughs> With that, um, I, you know, I've tried to be as brief as possible, but uh, uh, there's probably some questions that you have, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer any questions that you have. Go ahead, um, I'm not um, uh, too lightly, but um, will we, we be able to recycle our current bin? A actually, yes. Um, you, you'll have a couple of different options. You can keep them and do what you will with them, or you can we can take them down at the uh, recycling center, and that fits into the a, a category called bulky number two plastics, and yeah, we can recycle. Okay. Well, I think this makes a lot of sense. And um, the fact that there's some cost savings, and uh, I agree with you. Uh, I use uh, two bins uh, rather than just put the stuff in the trash. But sometimes um, I don't think people have that ability. Um, and um, we need to keep recycling. So I uh, stay with this. Yeah. Wait, what is the. Uh, We don't have any formal relationship. We we represent the cities. Where do we pay Rasas to belong to the recycling center? Uh, do we have a fee? Like you have you have seventeen thousand something. Was that a real? Do you have a figure? Somebody. Yeah. Let, well, you, you you have you have a member contribution that you pay us to cover our administrative costs. Mm -hmm. Last year last year your net cost was fifty one thousand dollars. We're actually projecting for. Um, 2012-2013, that will be no net cost. In fact, it will be a, a net value of, of uh, about $2,500. I will tell you that uh, part, part of the value of, of belonging to Rossock is that um, we, we do these types of things. We negotiate very low-cost contracts, and we did a study in 2010, and we found that the, uh, the savings to the city, the city's per capita cost were actually 30, for, for solid waste services were 36% below the regional median uh, worth about 1.8 million dollars a year that you're saving because what you're doing is you're buying services jointly with your neighboring communities such as Farmington, Farmington Hills, Wixom, and so on and so forth. And so what we do on behalf of the cities is we solicit contracts for them. The contract that you have with waste management is between the city of Southfield and waste management and then the city has a separate agreement with us for MRF services uh, by which 
we process the material that comes from the city, and in return for that, we provide revenue sharing back to the city. Last year, the revenue wasn't as high as it otherwise could have been because we're still coming off the commodity lows from the recession, but we're seeing uh, large increases this year, and uh, we're anticipating that that will continue to grow because as you move to carts, you're going to see an increase in recycling. Uh, in fact, we're anticipating at least $23,000 in additional revenue just from moving to carts alone. Um, and uh, your uh, first quarter revenues were about $14,000 combined. With, you also get the revenue from the drop-off center, which is another $5,000. So you're, you're at nearly $20,000 uh, for the first quarter <coughs> of, of this current fiscal year. That's the city's return? That's, that's the city's, that's city the city's return. return. Yes. <coughs> we pay uh, $51,000. The cost is fifty-one thousand. This 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 current fiscal year was uh, fifty-one thousand dollars. So is it? So okay. So we end up paying. This is it stated that that in switching uh, we have a fifty thousand dollars savings. Is that correct? Yeah. That you're gonna have you're gonna have yeah. your contract cost with waste management will go down about fifty thousand, and then you'll see another increase in. Uh, Revenue of about twenty-three thousand, so a net value of seventy-three thousand dollars per year. And again, I, you know, I, I'd urge you to remember too that you're seeing a fifty thousand dollar cost reduction off a low bidder that was thirty-one percent below your original, uh, your, your next lowest bidder when this was bid out for the contract that is currently in place. Well, I'm asking this question because because the uh, removal business is uh, getting pretty competitive. So you have to remove people from the board. Uh, you have an existing uh, uh, competitor, and you're going to have a new competitor. Uh, and I told the administrator today that I want to uh, go to an RFP so that the other individuals can bid. And that's why I asked what the relationship was between Grasslock and Waste uh, Management because it may be an existing uh, contract with uh, Grasslock, but I would like to see us take. <coughs> and uh, and bid this out uh, because I think when you add these uh, one cart for garbage and, re and recyclables, you you've got less people on the truck, you have less manpower. You've got the inconvenience to people there having to house these big tubs. And uh, and what happens if they have more uh, rubbish to pick up? We just have spring pickup. <coughs> now Southfield advertises that. Anything you want to get rid of, you throw out chairs, everything. Okay. <coughs> so how does that fit in with with your new pickup uh, in the receptacle? That that doesn't <coughs> change. The, the only thing that changes well, is you're moving from the. From well, the why the change then? If it's the same, could anybody be, can be throw out the garbage bag and and get it picked up, and they may have I don't know what a rubbish cart holds, but if it holds three or four. Uh, Garbage bags, and you have eight garbage bags, and you don't have it on the side. But you're Who not getting up the, the balance of the rubbish. If, if, if I may, you're not getting a new cart for trash. You're only getting a cart for recycling. You're just replacing the recycling bin with a recycling cart because the cart holds more recyclables. You will still use the same trash cans. Still set your bags out by the curb for regular trash pickup. That won't change. The the residents will not see any change at the curb, with the exception of they'll get a bin. Instead of a, uh, they get a car instead of a bin, and they won't have to do any sorting with their recycling. But they'll still have the same trash cans. They'll still have the same trash bags. But the city will see a cost reduction. And you mentioned a new competitor. There actually isn't a new competitor. What you're referring to is Veolia, which was, which is a company that uh, bid on your contract last time and was 37 percent above waste management. They are up for sale. It's a it's a French company that's up for sale, and they have a landfill here in Southeast Michigan. They don't have any. Uh, residential hauling services, but it's speculated that someone may buy that company, and if they buy that company, they may begin to provide residential services in Southeast it's Michigan. It's a waste. probably going to buy that company. And they'll be a big bidder in this. And, uh, and so I, I don't see the city paying itself up into a six year contract with no flexibility. And, and uh, I mean, I think the city is up to be at 8 10 percent. I don't, I don't see much of the savings in 2% going through all this 
no, I just don't see it. I know that all the other communities are are interested in in getting together to have one resource and pick up, and it's easier to uh, to work with the new container and the truck picking it up. But I mean, I don't. I don't uh, think it's worth going into uh, a six-year contract. That doesn't make me interested at all. And uh, and like I said, I want to go out to an RFP on the whole and I love this issue. Well, we, when we had spring cleanup, you know, we, we stated out on our people that uh, we put everything out that you have and, and we'll pick up and we're willing to pay that price to have that luxurious uh, uh, service. <coughs> and uh, it's kind of, you know, that there's no stipulation stating that you're not going to go to a park for rubbish. And that's what all the cities have, they're either one color for one and one for the other. And they, you know, haul them back into their garages and pick up the car space for I mean, you've got, I mean, that's a new trend. And, uh, you know, they're even showing in American cities trucks and how they pick up and all the various uh, examples. But we're in a transition right now, and and I just would like to see how much, you know, if I can save more money. I mean, you know, things are getting rough around here. I know they're rough for everybody, but I'm not, you know, everything has got to be competitive to me anymore. Uh, well, I can tell you, I can tell you, the Ross out of $50,000, I don't think that, to me, that isn't worth even fooling with. Well, I can tell you, the Ross board, board of directors look at this. Well, I, no, I don't want to. I don't even want to mention the board. It has nothing to do with me. Okay. Oh. They vote. Would they vote? They vote. That's their problem. Okay. If they save money and, and create service, that's fine and dandy. But that because <coughs> there's two. I see two different groups here. I see waste management, and I see that. And if you want to talk about the ransack, that's one thing. Waste management. That's a whole different other thing. And and they'll have to speak for their contract and their services to the city. That's I can speak to the recycling center and how it can be a bit more effective in, in the dealings. But I don't I don't see uh, us giving up that uh, so what was the year? Twenty months? Twenty 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 two and be tied to a contract? No way. No way. Well we 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 brought this to you this evening because it was an option that was to us yeah, as an opportunity for the city to save money within the year. This should have come with some money then. I mean, you're looking for something in the $100,000 range. I'm not talking about $50,000. I mean, you know, you're talking about recycling. You're saving only $20,000, $23,000. You pay $51,000. $51,000, city pay though. Is that correct? Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I, you know, I, I like the presentation and I like the containers, but there's not enough money on the table for me. Is it going to change if I up this? I know there's other companies. Dear Lord, just switched. Uh, you know, I just, I just, just money's hard to find. You know, you only got a few pennies left in your, your fund, you know, and uh, so everybody's got to come to the table now. We have to be paid this to pay our contracts. Yeah, and, and if anything, I'd like to see it go before the finance committee and really beat this thing up. I'm laughing with you, not at you. 
if, uh, and I think it's a good idea, so I'd like to the uh, finance committee to take a look at it. <coughs> See if there's a, a way that if we have a serious bidder that comes in sometime within that, that we can open up the contract. Um, it can't be willy-nilly, but it, it needs to be in the, in the contract that if we have something that's very serious, then because as Mr. Picasso says, this is a cutthroat business. The other, the other thing that, uh, there are a couple of other things. One is, will this include new items that we can recycle? Yes, and those, those are going to incl be included regardless because of, of the, the new processing at our facility. As I mentioned, I think last time I was here, we are adding some materials. We're adding wide mouth containers, for example. We're adding agricultural plastics like your, your, your Oh, I'm sorry. I, I keep forgetting this is an on. Um, we're, we, yes, we, we, are, we are adding uh, wide mouth containers, you know, your yogurt containers, your butter tubs, those types of things, cool up containers. Those are being added. So basically all your plastics, uh, with the exception of number three plastics, and then we're adding the agricultural pots, you know, your flower flats, your, your, your plant trays, those type of things. Those are being added. Regardless of whatever you do with your hauling contract, those changes are taking place. We're taking a couple things away. We're going to get rid of plastic bags because those aren't recyclable. Uh, but we are making changes, adding to the number, total number of things that people can put in their bin, which is one of the reasons why we've advocated moving to the cart system. Because if people have more, they'll be able to recycle more, and the cart makes it easier, more convenient for them to do that. Which is again one of the reasons why we proposed way or suggested waste management in the first place to propose to add carts and replace the bins. And when they came back and said we could save you money, at the same time we add the carts and they'll pay for the carts um, in exchange for an extension. We thought it prudent to bring it before the individual member communities and, and see what they thought. We recognize the concern over a long contract <coughs> extension. That always gives folks pause, you know. And I just go back to the fact that you've got a little bit of this lowering their prices within the term of an existing contract, and it's a very good it's a very good service. You know, you've had waste management for years, so so on that basis, we've we've endorsed it, uh, but we recognize that you know cities are always trying to figure out ways to to uh, eke as much out of these things as they can, and so you know, uh, but th we will be adding those materials regardless, and we'll be letting res residents know about that through our normal communications. When will they be added? Well, actually they were added as of January 1st. Uh, we just haven't sent out any uh, notice direct mail stuff to the residents because we wanted to try and kill the birds with one stone. If you move to carts, we want to tell them about the carts at the same time we tell them about the new items. You have to tell your driver. Well, it's not him, it's waste management. Waste management is going to have to tell the driver. Yes. They keep putting the plastic flower pots they, they won't told me they wouldn't take them. They don't like, they like me very much, like you, because they took mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> what about uh, styrofoam? Styrofoam is, is not really recyclable. It's a big challenge. We do take it out of our drop off because the, the one and only outlet, dark container in Mason, Michigan, will take it if they, if they can come and get it clean. But you just can't mix that and stuff up in the truck and put it across processing equipment. It breaks all up and you've got styrofoam everywhere and there's no value to it whatsoever. Uh, DART does it because they're, they're trying to uh, stem any you know, laws or regulations that may pertain to it, but in terms of putting in the curbside bin, it, it just, or card or bin, whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense from either a, a materials processing standpoint or from a cost standpoint. Myron, if you've been down to the uh, bar the whole front is now styrofoam containers, and I applaud you for that. Thank you. Um, so much packaging comes with styrofoam. Bin after bin after bin out front for styrofoam. And we, and we take that largely as, as a service to the residents so that if they have styrofoam, hopefully they're coming and bringing it to us as opposed to throwing away. We, we can't get DART to come and take it, but we don't make any money on it. We're, what we're hoping is when they come to recycle their styrofoam, they're also bringing us the cardboard that came along with it on <coughs> which we can make money. And again, that money, if it comes to our drop off center and we sell that material, that, that money uh, at the drop off center uh, under contract comes. In fact, that's the provision Sue insisted, insisted on. It comes right back to the city. Okay, there's another thing, too, and that, and that currently happens, and it's not my argument with you, but with waste management, and that is promulgated cardboard, uh, cardboard boxes. I uh, periodically have cardboard boxes that I 
break down mm -hmm. the time in bundles. And in, I would say, the majority of the, the cases, the driver that's picking up recyclables puts them right over on the trash and he won't pick them up. <coughs> and uh, to me, that defeats yes. the, the, the recycling. And, uh, you know, I put it with the, the tub, but I look out because the recycler comes by <coughs> first and the, the trash collector comes by second. And so we're by the, by the trash and it goes into the, it goes into the dump. We, we hear that from residents more often than we'd like. Sometimes it is a, 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 an honest mistake by the truck driver. Sometimes it is the fact that it might not have been bundled up well enough to, to the right side to fit in that little hopper on the side of the truck, which is one of the advantages of moving a single stream because you don't have to worry about that. You can use a larger truck. It all goes in the truck together. And, and then when you have the carts, you know, it, it all fits in the cart better. So you just throw it all in there, and then the truck comes by and gets it. So that, that issue goes away when you move to single stream. But it is a matter of educating the truck drivers many times. Okay. Um, also, if you when you do advertise and you say you're going to, um, I think your the brochure that you send out to the house really ought to be clear, uh, so that mm -hmm. not so that people understand it, but so they don't misunderstand right. what's what they can recycle. Um, because the the ones that have come out, you look at it and say. Can I recycle this or not? And if there's a question, I recycle it. Right. And that's yeah. what we want you to do. If you have any question, put it in the bin. If it's something that we can't recycle, we'll take it out and throw it away. Um, which is a change from years ago. It was when in doubt, throw it out. Now we should just throw it out on the bin. But the beauty of single stream and the new system that we have down there, which I encourage you all, by the way, to come and see, um, they can really handle those residual materials. So if something ends up in the bin or the cart that doesn't belong there, we can grab it and move it out and still very clean product for paper mills. Okay, and the last thing I have to say is on these uh, the, the carts, uh, I don't really have a problem with them, but I I do have some relatives that live in the city where they do use the carts, and one of them, he was saying that uh, the truck broke his car, you know, because he picked it up in the arm and bang, 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 bang and, and, and broke the cart. He complained, and they brought him another broken car. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it's one one of the advantages, as I mentioned earlier, about moving to the cars. Obviously, we don't want them to bring a broken cart out, but under the new provisions, your hauler would be responsible for replacing that car. Currently, if a resident has a bin and it's broken, they've got to come here to City Hall and yeah. get one, and City will have had to buy those and provide them. And, and so that, that management of those bins goes away when you go to the cars because the contractor will, will be responsible for those. But obviously, they have to bring out a, a my question is, how bad does the car have to be before it gets replaced? And what is the process for getting it replaced? Well, if it's if it's broken, it's broken. It needs to be replaced. And then uh, it's a matter of calling the Department of Public Works, and then the Development Works Office lets the rough supervisor know that we need a car, okay. and it gets out there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just one quick question. You may have answered. What other surrounding communities, neighboring communities, are you doing? Cars. You know, waste management guys can tell you who their customers have carts. I can tell you that I do know, for example, that uh, Rochester Hills has gone to carts, Hunting the Woods has gone to carts, uh, Taylor has gone to carts, Westland has gone to carts, uh, uh, in a couple of our other Rossock communities, uh, Wall Lake and South Lyon, they're moving to carts. Uh, so you, you see, you see it, it is the trend to move to the curbside carts. Again, because it's automated collection, it's much more efficient, it's easier for the resident, they can recycle more, and uh, it can be done you know, more cost-effectively. But it's a, it's a transition um, in the waste, the Rossock communities that are customers of waste management include Southfield, Wixom, Farmington, and Farmington Hills. All four of those communities are basically reviewing the same proposal, and, uh, and the two of the cities have re reviewed it in, in a work session, and it favorably. They haven't taken formal action on that yet, um, but it's it's uh, it's a trend that you'll see more of. And if you look across the country, it's most certainly a trend. And in some areas, it's been it's been around for much longer than it has here in Southeast Michigan. Oh. I'm also not in favor of living with anyone else.
anybody uh, thought of picking up scrap metal? Well, we do household scrap metal already, like your toasters, wafflers, that type of thing. But in terms of larger pieces of scrap metal, no, that's not something that's really conducive to curbside collection, and we really wouldn't be able to handle that at the processing equipment. And, and typically, if you're seeing large scrap metals off the curb, you certainly can do that. You could almost, bet about a dollar, there's going to be a guy out there in the pickup truck picking it up anyway. Yeah, in some, some communities are prohibiting anybody going to trash. Right. And, and picking up the metal. Right. And uh, I know in the occasions where, where the person is losing their home, they put all the trash out to the street. And <coughs> before we get it picked up, the metal guys go through and they spread that stuff all over the front yards, driveways, and everything right. else. They're looking for it. And Birmingham, I know they have prohibited anybody yeah. going through their trash. And you, you generally have an anti scavenging ordinance. In, in City, I believe. I know some of our community, I think Southfield does as well. So technically that's already illegal. We don't have no? Okay. I know I know we do in, in Wixom, for example, um, some of our other cities, they have anti scavenging ordinances in place already. Um, and then the other the other issue is um, you know, where can the homeowner take that material if they want to take it and sell it? Currently there are no scrap yards in Southfield, uh, but there are some opportunities and we we're even discussing them with some of the market player to find, try and make that service available in Southfield, not really have a scrapyard per se, but a, a, a retail outlet, if you will, where people can bring in their scrap metal, but that's that's probably a long ways off. They have one in, uh, in Waterford, just takes everything, all the metal. Yeah. There's one in Walled Lake, there's one in the East End here on 8 Mile as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Pamela Gerald, P.O. Box 155, South Michigan, 48037-0155. I just want to remind council and the elected officials and city administration that the citizens are at the top of the organizational chart, and all of you work for us. Uh, I also wanted to say contradiction without an investigation is one of the highest forms of ignorance. In addition to when the facts are clear and you draw a conclusion based on prejudice or what you perceive to be, that's also ignorance. Now, I want to get right into the issue because I don't want to take up a whole lot of time. We are still talking about the fact that as of May of 2011, we have not had a police chief. 
there have been a lot of serious allegations still circulating around in the community in reference to this potential candidacy, some of the things that have gone wrong maybe with one of the chiefs. We don't, as residents, want to be a part of the selection process. We want to make sure the process is fair. I am applauding Ms. Stephanie English for her level of research, because I'm not a researcher like that. I don't get the research the way she does. So I'm applauding the fact that people are concerned enough about it to come and speak up about it. I also want to talk about the fact that crime has escalated in this city. And to have our police officers coming before council with financial concerns, medical concerns, how much they have to pay, that's a distraction to the manner in which they are policing this community. They should not have to be concerned about that. I'm also upset about the fact that we've had a $2.2 million SAFER grant that was approved in February that you guys have not accepted for our firefighters to replace retired staff. And you guys keep misleading the public, talking about the fact that there's an issue in Royal Oak. Well, I did some research, and I reached out to other surrounding communities. And let me tell you what I found, and I would impress upon the chairwoman to allow Mr. Charette to answer the question. Now, the SAFER grant that we got was to replace retirement staff. You guys keep tossing around Royal Oak. Royal Oak, what they did was they laid off their staff first. Their SAFER grant was to bring back the staff so they wouldn't have an increase in, in terms of the number of employees. So all they're basically doing is playing, paying for existing people. Now, you keep talking about, again, reselling these foreclosed homes. A community is only as viable as their public safety. If you guys are mistreating our police officers, not appreciating them, mistreating our firefighters and not appreciating them, you can give the houses away. It is not going to make a difference <coughs> in how crime has escalated in this city, as well as fires. Now, I would like for someone on the official record in council to either ask the question of Mr. Jim Charette or the chairwoman to make Mr. Charette answer the question. Why have we not accepted that SAFER grant? What is the difference between the Southfield SAFER grant and the Royal Oak grant? I reached out to a grant writer. The government never changes the criteria after the grant has been awarded. Now, can he answer that question? And I would be willing to acquiesce some of my four minutes and 45 seconds that I'm now going to try to speak to get an answer to that question. So he's not going to answer the question. Why should our public safety have to deal with this? Why are you guys pressing the issue about a nature center when it's a great idea but not right now and not at the expense of our public safety? You guys are talking about these deadlines for the grant, the EPA grant. We want to build this facility. Nature is all around us. Do we want an interpretive center or do we want a strong police and fire equipped to do what they need to do for us residents? Anybody? You willing to a answer the question? This is not a dialogue. This is not a well, you have made it previously a dialogue because when you had your supporters, the nature lovers, to come and talk about how they wanted this interpretive center, you answered them. And as it was alluded to before previously by a very eloquent speaker, you answer the people that you want. You give the people that you want more time. Thank you. Good evening. First of all, I want to say thank you for allowing me to speak before this esteemed body. My name is Karen Allen. My address is P.O. Box 4104, Southfield, Michigan, 48037. My telephone number is 248-562-2171. And the reason I am I asked to speak before the body today is because I did see the presentation that Ms. English presented before the council. 
And I'm concerned because there's a perception of impropriety in the process of choosing a police chief. Now, we all are, were fond of Chief Thomas. I was a fond of him, and I'm sure many of you in the room were fond of him. And it concerns me because I would hate to see his legacy be surrounded by a cloud of impropriety. I would like to know the process in which Chief Thomas was selected, and then is that process still appropriate for choosing a chief today? Now, I don't know if you all follow hip hop, but I recall probably back in, over 10 years ago, the murders of Tupac and Biggie Smalls. That police chief was clouded, deeply rooted into the impropriety, impropriety of what happened between those murders and eventually he did leave that position. And then eventually we saw what happened with uh, the police chief over in Detroit. So my question basically is what is the process? Is there transparency when it comes to choosing the police chief? And then I also heard about there's a standard for Southfield. And I looked on the website and I did not find anything written that says there is an absolute standard for the city of Southfield. Now my background is in engineering. And in order for us to design something, we develop our standard, which we put against the actual process in presenting or manifesting a project. And we compare the two. And I just like to see the comparison and how Police Chief Thomas was selected and how the new chief is going to be selected. I don't know if the records were doctors or whatever. Didn't try to investigate it. I just heard a citizen speak out, and I'm speaking out as well. Because I was very fond of Chief Thomas and his accomplishments and would like to see his legacy live on as being something that we all can be proud of and not cloud his legacy in proprietary. Thank you. Officer Gerald's letter of response itself, 
The letter is exceptionally well written, maybe I should say suspiciously well written. Writing skills of this quality are reflective of professional writers or people who write ex extensively in their professions. As an adjunct faculty member that has to determine the authenticity of college student essays, I am skeptical that Officer Gerald authored this document. I understand there is a Freedom of Information after FOIA request in to obtain Officer Gerald's writing test scores. That should be helpful in determining whether he authored this letter as would any other samples of his writing done on the job. Does it matter if someone else wrote this letter for him? I think so. The letter is far more than an answer since it portends to reflect the writer's command of language and analytical ability to articulate a complex argument. Any misrepresentation in that regard is disingenuous. An excellent writing of verbal skills are called for in the job description. If I am right, then there is a rich irony here. Accused of alleged misrepresentation, Officer Gerald submits a response letter of explanation that also misrepresents him. Note the letter was submitted in his name and started out, quote, I am writing this correspondence, unquote. I and others think this type of misrepresentation is unacceptable. The role of police chief is critical within our community. The chief sets the tone and temperament and the expectations for conduct and professional behavior within the department. Mr. Charette has offered explanation based on a recent contact with previous Chief, chief Thomas. I have great respect for Mr. Charette, but prestige and rank do not grant immunity. Many notable dignitaries have had the truth come back to bite them. People like Presidents Nixon and Clinton and Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, to name just a few, found that attempting to hide the truth only made matters worse. I suggest to the city that all Freedom of Information Act or FOIA requests be honored in a timely fashion <coughs> and that the process for producing that information be untainted. Also, I am of the impression that this matter has negatively affected police department morale. If in doubt, the council should consider bringing in an independent evaluator <coughs> to gauge the, the degree of, of staff's dissatisfaction. All leaders make difficult decisions that impact personnel, but contrary to Officer Jarrell's assertion of a revenge conspiracy, not all leaders are unpopular with their staff. Southfield citizens expect no less than the best, so let's not create a situation that reflects poorly on our city. Remember that your appointment decision will have to hold up to the scrutiny of voters as well as outside observers. I have a few seconds to last, so let me just point out that the job description had a list of attributes. Presumably the candidates are measured against these attributes. If that in fact has taken place, I would presume that a FOIA request would produce that data. And if those measurements were not made, measurements of rank or objectivity, then how is the selection process made? And that's it. Thank you. Ms. Seymour, can I take you up on your office? May I take you up on your office? Yes. Stephanie English, 28735 San Carlos, Southfield, Michigan, 4876. I wasn't prepared to speak this evening because I was told that I couldn't even though I had sent my request form in in a timely manner. They said it's broken. I want to thank the woman back there who I didn't know was going to speak on my behalf, also Richard Meltzer. I just want to say that I'm pushing forward very hard to bring substantial facts to the table. These are not inferences. These are not guesses. I don't hold any aspersions to Brian Gerald, but I hold any aspersion to any city leader that takes advantage of position and power and actually creates any type of corporate theft. One dollar is too much. I had a meeting off record with a council person last week, and that was the question that I posed to that council person. If a person commits any type of embezzlement, is one dollar enough, or does it have to be in the tens of thousands of dollars? It's not just the actual days, perhaps, of embezzlement, but it's what's calculated after that. It is possible, based on what I've seen on the website in terms of the deputy chief contract, that if you actually have so much vacation time at the end of your retirement, it actually pads your retirement. So we're not talking about just the calculation of 
uh, if it's a $90,000 salary at 375 a day times 40, that's approximately $15,000 just for those days. If you actually put that vacation time in a bank that you can actually use at the time that you retire, then you have had your retirement. If it's 20 years and maybe it's just $3,000 a year, that's $60,000 that you add. Very quickly, as of today, I've already gone to the SBI. I have to take all my materials tomorrow. What I am imploring to the agent that I speak with tomorrow is that instead of going to the Oakland County Sheriff, which I believe that Chief Gerald would already have relationships with that police agency, I'm really going to implore that they keep it in-house or somehow they go to the state where the relationships may not have been built and there can be that uh, feeling and that image of propriety. That is tomorrow morning. I did not want to embarrass the city at all. I've worked too hard trying to penetrate in these walls that I am having these hurdles to get my FOIA request. I've pretty much given it up. I will tell you that I think it's highly improper that I found out that the person that prepares the FOIAs for the police department, Mary Stefla, is Brian Gerald's direct report. There is no, that is, in my opinion, why I am having the pushback in terms of getting my FOIA requested and the prohibitive, prohibitive costs that are going along with that. $1,000, every single piece of private information and personal information pertaining to him, I'm getting denials back, and it wasn't until last week that I realized that the allegations, the FOIA requests that I'm getting, I, that I'm asking for, are going right to the person who the allegations are against. I can't win in that kind of environment. I cannot win in that kind of environment. So I've given that up, and I'm going to pray that the FBI can actually handle this. I've also gone to Jeffrey Figer to ask for him to look into any suppression action that I can take for not getting my FOIA answered. And that's all I can do at this point because I'm not getting, there's no council person that is approaching me to say, what are the facts? The one council person that did entertain did listen, and that's Mr. Sid Lance, and that was an offline conversation. But I have reached out to other council persons, and I expected some council persons to reach out to me. But instead, you all attack and malign me and treat me as if I am wrong, that I am doing something wrong. I don't know what your calculation is, your tolerance is for embezzlement, but in my world, one dollar is too much. There's substantial hard evidence that's not being asked for. You're making the people that are coming with the truth working hard, and you're casting aspersions to us, and I don't understand that kind of environment. That's all I have to say. And I thank the woman in the back, and I thank Richard, I thank Pam for speaking on my behalf, and I thank all the officers that thought I was creditable enough to present it. They need to come to our city to take care of us. They need to want to come to take care of us. We're a predominantly black city with white officers who need to feel more just uplifted to come and take care of us. And that's why I fought this. But I've given it up, and I'm hoping that the higher standard and the higher authority can help me with it.
And I don't believe that this city would do anything, hire anyone differently than the standards that have been set, not only with the previous police chief, but with all the other departmental positions that we feel. So I'm just a little upset at this point that this, these words are constantly being put out there that we're operating under the table, that we're not doing anything above board, because I would not be on this council if that would be happening. And I've worked with you, Mr. Charette, and I know you're a man of integrity, and I do not believe that this city is, um, should be faced with these allegations that we are being faced with, particularly since the position has not been hired. We have not hired anyone for that position. But it appears Mr. Gerald's name is being smeared. Um, and I'm not saying he's the right person for the position. We don't know. But I do not appreciate all of these allegations week after week as if the city of Southfield has done something wrong. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, <coughs> request to schedule a public hearing. Madam President, uh, Honorable Council, Mayor and Clerk, we have a request uh, to schedule a public hearing for uh, February 13th to the City of Southfield's Neighborhood Stabilization Program uh, Number 3's Administrative Plan. The uh, amendment is minor in nature, and it'll, the amendment, the proposed amendment that's currently being reviewed by HUD at this time would permit us to use NSP3 funds to complete renovations of homes purchased with NSP1 funds. Candidly, when staff prepared the plan, it was our intent all along. HUD, upon the review process of the plan, felt that we should make it clear that it was our intent to use these funds to complete renovations of NSP1 homes. <coughs> Uh, I am also asking the uh, council to uh, initiate a Rule 10 as permitted by the uh, council's rules and procedures in consideration of time. That would allow us to get the notice uh, published. It would be made available for the uh, public review uh, commencing on Wednesday, January 18th. And then we would conduct the public hearing as required by the City of Southfield's uh, CDBG plan and HUD's uh, regulations. I'd move a real
this will guarantee that we'll be able to complete the renovations of those 18 homes uh, as well. We already own those homes? Yes, sir. If, if you'll recall, our NSP plan was targeted to we had a buyer and we bought the home. We also had an 18 month uh, deadline period to make all, to have all of our funds committed. Mm -hmm. As we were pursuing, we didn't have, we had not spent enough money quick enough to fulfill eight, the HUD's 18 month requirement. So we bought homes on speculation. Most communities went out and bought homes on, on, on speculation and are, are, are using NSP free funds I as well. The match was, was candidly very labor intensive because you're working with the home to buy or to select the home, right. make sure that they you know, go through the education, got the three and a half percent, that they're within their pity, their principal interest, tax, um, I'm forgetting one of them. And what? Homeowners, Homeowners insurance. insurance uh, within that 30 percent, we made sure we went in. We did that very well. <coughs> now we've got these spec homes that we need to complete the renovations. Candidly, we bought some more challenged homes, the homes that when we went in, we knew we had issues. We bought them because the marketplace was ignoring them. The better homes were bought up. So the 18 homes we have to finish, we have six, six or seven, six have been committed to potential buyers. This will allow us to complete the renovation and ensure that we have adequate cash flow to complete those homes. Okay, now the other uh, the other 12 homes that we bought on speculation, yep. that was always a concern of mine, and it was a, was a problem that uh, we had the homes, we purchased, we remodeled them, and the people didn't want them because their concept of what kind of home they wanted was, so to find the match was pretty tough. Yeah, absolutely. And what happens now at the end of the five years, because we had a five year, that was a five year window that we had to get all this done or we had to turn the money back in. Right. What um, happens if we still have those homes? Well, our, our, it, within our NSP1 and our NSP3 plan, we have wrote what I kind of uh, call a, a fallback position. They simply become rental stock, either managed by the Housing Commission or the Southfield nonprofit or turned over to another nonprofit. But we wrote language in there flex, flexible that in the event we were in that position. That was a concern, particularly if you recall the 25% set aside right. for low income, because uh, getting uh, low income families to, to meet the mortgage and within that pity calculation, that was a big challenge for us. Okay. All right. What What are we going to do differently, or what are the challenges that prohibit us from meeting our deadline? So going forward, what what's going to be different so that we can fulfill the, the, the requirement for allocating the funds and completing the the renovations to these homes? Because that's been a major challenge. A absolutely, because the first process, the homeowner was guiding the renovation. We were working with them to get the bid. Now we've had to retool, and we've hired spec writers. We've, we've got uh, four different firms, that three firms that we've lined up to prepare and write specifications. Uh, we've got specs written. So we're going to go through a more uh, formal process before it was the homeowner driving that process. I'm concerned about the ability to respond um, and manage the whole process and meet these timelines, especially for having that many homes. Um, I would say, I would say publicly here that we really need to look at our process. And we really need to look at our process and our follow through to, to, to ensure that we are, because I don't want to turn money back in. I don't want these homes to turn into real homes. And we own them and we should have, there should be a timeline that there is accountability to. Mm -hmm. if, if we say we're going to do it and we're going to put these things wherever our contractors are, there should be a timeline, the staff should be managing that, or you, or mm -hmm. there should be accountability that if we have a certain amount of things to do, what are the timelines are we holding, are we holding people's feet to the fire? And if they don't, then we don't pay them, but we should have contractors and, or staff or anyone it's 
staff to, staff agrees with you. Absolutely. Well, it's not happening, so what's going to be different? We, well, I, I, I guess we, we have made progress. You put over 40 families in homes. Yes, yes. I mean, so so there has yes, been. But we still have. Yeah. We still have that issue, and I, I guess I'm not trying to debate it. I just really want this program to have timelines and accountability. Time and we, if we if we back up on one house and we do a house by house, and I know we've done multiple homes, but we've had issues with contractors, we have issues with follow through with staff. It's it's a combination of things, and if we have, it will allow us to meet our time because, as you know, HUD has not been the friendly agency lately, and we really need to meet our time. Um, staff can come back and we can, we can develop a timeline if that's what council would like. And, uh, we actually... Well, wouldn't that help you? We, it, it would help us, but more what would be, I'm going to let my timeline be driven by where I have potential customers as well. I'm just 
every one of my staff members could Rather spend a couple hours on just what it takes to get a mortgage and go through an appraisal process. We've got properties that have six, seven homes. We shop different mortgages. Uh, every, every one of them, every, every, there's a number of, of different detours that every transaction can take. Our first homes, and when we sit down, I'll walk you through our first couple of case studies. First homes, we bought them, made renovations, and actually were able to sell them for what we paid and bought minus the cost of the environmental remediation, mold remediation, water. We're now to the point that the homes we're buying the cost of repairing them and appraising at roughly $45 a square foot and renovations running $40 a square foot that the formula is beginning to go upside down. I can show you uh, the best example of two homes on Avon uh, Street where we bought them, renovated, pretty much got certificates, well not pretty much, we got certificates of compliance for occupancy. We were able to sell those homes with very little subsidy or loss to those homes. That was the NSP model 15 months ago. Today, where we're at with the NSP model, it, it, is, it is half of what it was 15 months ago. Hmm. Appraisals that were at $80 a square foot are now $40, $45 a square foot. That's our, our, our biggest hurdle. That's why the reason for the amendment, to ensure that we have cash flow to complete those homes that we bought. We knew when we bought those homes we had conversations with our HUD field staff, allow us to work our model, we think it could work. We had to show that funds were committed by, what was it, September 1 of 2010. Mm -hmm. And in order to meet that completion date, we did in the spring of 2010 go on a speculative shopping spree. Uh, those, are the kind of, those, excuse me, those are the kind of things that I think yeah. we really yeah. need to I understand. I could take it through an Excel yeah. spreadsheet on every property. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I mean, there's so many crazy things happening out there. Somebody told me the other day their house isn't underwater. They they uh, went to try to get a better interest rate. They were at six and a half, and they figured that everybody's advertising four and a half, whatever, to save a couple of points. And and they cannot get a, they're even a refinancing. When everything is good, good credit and everything else, they can't get it. I mean, the banks are doing nothing, and and somebody's going to have to step in and find out what it's going to take to loosen up that money and start taking care of these homes because you know the what they're doing is they're selling they're selling these loans because it's six and a half percent mortgage, you know, and they're getting the money for nothing, and it's all these are all being bundled and 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 investors are buying them and. And you know you can make six and a half, and you own not even a percentage in the bank in the savings account. So they're making big money on this deal. Maybe that's why the banks aren't loaning money. I don't know, but something's happening under the somewhere that I just don't get anymore. But I mean, if a person got this credit and the house is worth X amount of dollars, and uh, and the value is there, good credit, and everything else, well, you can't go and get a better we just said it. I mean, based on the current appraisal rules, the loan to value ratio is out of formula. That clears up more deals than anything we do. And I'm going to tell you our condos, the loan to value rules on condos got next impossible. You know, basically, we're being told all loan, that they'll only finance 80% on a condominium of the loan value because of the there are most of our, I think we have two condominium communities in Southfield that are on the FHA approval list. So the rest all have to go under the old 80-20 formula. you got to have 20% down. I know a lot of people, the big investors who have choking on their money are, are paying cash for these houses and getting them for nothing. You know, and, uh, and the guy who wants to buy them that's why these vacant homes aren't selling, because they can't get a finance. And a lot of what's left is in pretty bad shape. I mean, the homes we bought on speculation, we because you know, we went through, we looked at the character of the neighborhood, nice neighborhood, nice subdivision. Can we salvage that one home so you don't have this 
almost like a tooth missing and a nice white, you know, a nice pearly white smile. So. Somebody better step in and correct this thing because this is going to get worse. And so, what I would suggest uh, is the schedule list for February 6th BOW. But I would go, I would recommend going ahead with the public hearing. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have. Yeah, I just want to add to what Mr. said. I'd like to have a mortgage person be here and maybe a banker that tells what's going on, financing. Let's somebody find somebody that will tell us exactly what's uh, happening. We can there. put together a mortgage person mm -hmm. and, and an appraiser come in and talk about the FHA rules and yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. tell, them, tell them what's happening in the industry. Uh, tell them how do you know this individual will come and tell us what really what? Well, you got to take a chance at something. I mean, I don't know. We can't come up with it. We can get a bona fide on it. We can have a. Works with the, with the appraisers all the time, yeah. commercial, mm -hmm. residential. Yes, yeah, so, so you know, yeah. If you don't, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't have a one you're, you're comfortable with. I'm sure we can produce a person yeah. or two. Hi, so next <laughs> uh, I've got a question, and it has to do not so much as with the the timing of the event, but it has to do with um, the city standard of the residents that, that uh, occupy these homes, um, making sure that they can comply with the Southfield standard for home ownership. You know, because I believe um, Mr. Bears told me one of the homes on our block was under the neighborhood of uh, the and they were stabilization zone. And I mean, this homeowner, these cans out, they moved in the chickens, they, it's just, uh, it's terrible. They had chicken. chickens, they had chickens, yeah. so I had to come and, you know, kind of fight that. You don't have over the chickens, chickens out, and uh, they leave their garbage cans yeah. out any time of the Just day. Just pigs and goats, you can't. They don't, they don't comply with what the standard is. Yeah. This is, wow. So my question is, yes, we <laughs> want to get them in the homes, but how can we make sure that you know, we talk to them about standards for the city and not just getting a home at a very reasonable price, but making sure that you, you're an asset to the, to the neighborhood. Not only that you're filling the home, but you're making sure that you're filling with this. Through the chair of the council, woman, um, we spend a great deal of time uh, with our potential clients about the quality of life in general, financial responsibility. Each client is responsible for taking an eight-hour home buyer class. When they close, I personally see to it that they get a welcome packet so that they know the resources of the city and the do's and the don'ts. And this is the first that we're hearing of this, and I can assure you we'll do a drive-by. Right. And, and then I'm going to go ahead. I mean do, and I don't know if this is legal. Uh, in a year follow up just to kind of put some some uh, uh, pressure on them to make the other responsibility that we have as far as the program is monitoring and this year I conducted a survey of all of the clients that we have assisted and I asked some very specific questions uh, one it speaks to affordability of the home but some of the other questions we ask are are you a member of your homeowners association or condominium association? Um, are you involved in improving your home in any kind of way? If you've done some improvements, what have you done? And the list just goes on and on. So we do try to address it, but this sounds like an unusual situation, and we will definitely take it under advisement and address it. And I guess what I'm saying is maybe we can even be more proactive. Uh, not just asking them to join the association, but giving that association that this is the new homeowner in your city. This might be just a prime opportunity. Yeah, we do it both ways. To, you know, really um, assist the neighborhood with, with that uh, Does the chicken really call me Yeah, really. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, and I, I guess what, she, the, the wife is a, a young doctor 
who yeah, just started her career. Yeah, so I, I, I know who you are. And he's, yeah, he's, well, yeah, he's an electrician. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. Wow. So, how, I mean, they just barely qualified at yeah. the highest income. I mean, so, and if you met, I would never. Uh -uh. No. And that's his dog one loose that's about four feet We're happy. <laughs> I think we know <laughs> both well enough that we're happy to address that one head on. So, and, and apologize. If there are other homes in the area that you're aware of in these things, I mean, there's, as you all know, we are very limited in staff and our ability to touch upon each and every little nuance. But don't hesitate to give any of us a telephone call and let us know what you're seeing, yeah, we'll and we'll, we'll address it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, but not only to that, I just want to see if we can even just, again, this can be an opportunity that we can, if we may have to even redo our, our code for going into a, a new yeah. home. We need to, you know, we're going to follow up in a year. You know, we're going to be Thank you, lady. 
estimated uh, this at about 11.5 a year. Uh, Acumed, uh, the billing services the company that the fire department has worked uh, with, uh, uh, does have the capacity uh, to do this. And uh, recommending an ordinance or ordinances required. Uh, this board has drafted uh, an ordinance that would allow us uh, to recover uh, where where reasonable uh, and where appropriate for treatment, medical treatment, and transport of detainees and the facility. So, there is a consensus on this. Um, the time would be that we would bring this on the 23rd to the uh, consent agenda, and then we would move uh, to to get the ordinance uh, in full force in the month of February. Yes. Yeah, uh, 
Um, seems to me a few months ago we were talking about the ratio of, of uh, calls for actual fires versus medical emergencies that the fire department responds to. And if I recall right, one of the one of the things that came up was that our EMS folks are asked, being asked more and more for assistance in not in medical emergencies, but somebody fell out of bed. And rather than they get called to a nursing home, put somebody back in bed when it's not a it's not a medical emergency. Is there any consideration of making them making the nursing home stand the cost of that too? Because that's something they ought to be able. To, I mean, they should staff to put the folks back in bed. We've had that situation. I don't I don't see where a nursing home can get can can, can do that. They're all private. They do it. Get paid. They do it. The person has to have either Medicare or insurance. You call a nursing home, they're not going to go pick up the, the person that fell out of bed. Well, sir, it's in a nursing home. It's in a nursing home. What you're talking about in the nursing yeah. home. Yeah. Care patients. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that uh, the newest information is that the that the runs are up, emergency. Yeah, we have, uh, uh, this last year we had 300 uh, more medical runs than we did in 2000. 5%. 5%. So, you know, we need to do we need to do small work on that. I mean, our population is down, but our runs are up. Okay, so that requires some analysis to find out is it a lot of what you're talking about? Right. Are there more auto accidents, or what is it that's causing we caused a five percent increase when the population is increasing? And you know, we've also had those communications for. Repeat <coughs> problems of that nature. We've worked with the fire department, and, and there's been letters sent out sure. trying to advise people that you know this is not the, the appropriate use of, of this service. Right. These are for medical runs, not because you know yeah you need some assistance. I mean, to to a degree, yeah, I know that absolutely. you guys cooperate, but but if it's a if it's an offender that you call back, you know every other day or something. Those type of right. So, sure. so we do send letters out. We try to work with people again, so that we are more efficiently using the services of the yeah. department. Because they're overdoing that, they're not ready to to go the other direction. Maybe to Absolutely. do it something for real. Absolutely. We need to take a look at it. Why does this cost not be used by the people that do the hospital? Uh, well, because they don't have the authority. Well, the, the state law, there's a state law that says when you are a detainee or a prisoner, you are responsible for your own medical care. So it really is not an appropriate expense for WAC in our system. The person is responsible for their medical care. It's just that it's becoming more frequent. Right. And, and what complicates it here is that, you know, we're the provider because it's our fire department that's responding and doing the transport. I guess if it's a private ambulance company, you know, we wouldn't be incurring as much of, of these costs, but it's our fire department. So I think it's, it's appropriate that we that we have the ability to, to go after people now and say, you are responsible for this, for this cost. And WACC has, again, remember, kind of operates our facility for us on our behalf. So I, I don't know that they would have been interested. I know that we've had discussions about medical care, and, you know, they don't, they feel that they don't have the, necessary the expertise to, to know when to call for medical care. The thing is this, so our, our, our lawsuits are at an all time low. Uh, okay, uh, 20 year old time low. It's because we don't take chances. Piece of it. There's a lot of reasons why uh, the police department and the training and how they, how they handle people and respect the whole, the whole thing. Fire the same way, public works. But thing is, when, when there's a request for medical, and someone says, I have chest pains, we got to go the yeah. whole route. Oh, yeah. We can't take the, the and we should. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, not all people that are detained necessarily are found guilty. Even if they are, they still have rights to medical treatment. Okay. So, we want to get consensus.
said, well, now we need to do a whole uh, study presentation. We might, we might add a CFW thing before rating the meeting. So that's, that's the amendment that happened the most often. Uh, that's the amendment that happened the most often. I think we can work with it. Um, you know, one of the things that in my uh, previous life I was uh, very sensitive to is when you have a meeting, how much work it is for the, the staff to prepare for the meeting. And we have fewer people, and departments are, are stretched and so on. So um, I, I think this just is an appropriate move with the idea that we can always add meetings. Um, and I know myself, um, I usually don't schedule anything on a Monday night um, because I know chances are I'm going to be here. Mr. Prentice, who took over Morton's. 
It could have been him coming in and saying, hey, you know, you got a closed restaurant over there. Will you give me a license? I'm sorry, we don't have one. And that would be a big hit. You know? And so, so I, I use that as an example of, you know, going, going some of these things like 9 to 23, is that we're going from, from uh, 23 to uh, you know, from 13 to 5, February 13th to March 5th. It's a long time. Uh, not to be just discussing anything. It's like, you know, maybe we don't even need a council. Um, I have a problem with uh, uh, having the kind of discussion that you're talking about, Don, um, at this hour of night. Uh, and I think there's, there's um, a need for that, but it would be better to have a visioning session on a Saturday. We've done that before. So, you know, where we, we take the time. I, I, I agree with you that there's a need for it, but I don't think that necessarily our meetings are the most conducive when we have a regular stream of business and things, deadlines and so on. I would rather have that at another time that we set aside with just that uh, uh, purpose in mind. Well, that's what I've talked about. Yeah. Too, but, but it doesn't but have to be Saturday. If I'm sitting here sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning, I think some of our commissioners can come up with this. Well, you know, and spend the time with them. I would rather see it. My opinion. I, mean, I, I just would, I would rather see it on a, on a Saturday or something like that um, when uh, uh, we could have a, a more casual um, sit down. Yeah, you know, I, I can see both sides, and I really am not passionate behind either. You know, whatever happens, I'm, I'm okay with. Um, but one of the things I did notice is that in 2011, you know, we had two meetings in February, two meetings in March, two meetings in April. And maybe we can kind of go forward with the two, two, and two. And if we find we keep rescheduling or we keep having pressing issues as they come up, amend the fall. You know, maybe we do need to be a little bit heavy on uh, October, November, December. So that's just something I noticed with the trend of last year's schedule. But, you know, I can see both sides, and I'm really, there are issues I'm passionate about. And I'm okay. Yeah. Really, we have, coming up, the fall is not a problem for me. I mean, I, there's an election going on, but I mean, I'm worried about we have a budget. Okay. And we're starting, Jim, to work on the budget. We've got to get that to the mayor and that mm. to us to be approved by July 1. Okay. So, so you know, it depends on how hard you want to work on the budget. That's fair. I mean, how financially set are we as a city? That's fair. That's fair. I just tell you that some things are important. <coughs> to me, that's more important than the election. What's one of the ads somewhere? fairly close to the of January or thereabouts, probably something about the budget that we kick off. We usually have sort of a summary. I know now we talk so much about it that it's, <laughs> that it's almost redundant, but still we probably have to, you know, take, take some time and just go through where, you know, where we are, you know, what, what the parameters are, the upcoming budget. That's why you had three meetings in January. It was only the last meeting in January. Yeah. So. But uh, that, that could be an ad and we'll just work through the timing of it. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. uh, I, I think the, uh, the schedule is a little spartan. I can't you know, say <coughs> we don't have another meeting here, we have another meeting here. But maybe if I give you a concept, uh, new governors just turned our whole process upside down. Uh, how we get our finances is different. We've talked a little bit about it, but I don't think we've ever really kind of talked thoroughly about where do we go from here. The other thing, and while it's still a rumor, I think we, we've fooled ourselves and we just sat on our hands and didn't at least think about that that's St. Beat property. Uh, you know, it's been in the paper that, you know, there's some movement on foot that sell that and I know I'm getting some emails and telephone calls about we do or we don't want something to happen over in that corner and you know, I'd hate to have us get painted into a corner because all of a sudden the plans came we hadn't thought our way through it. 
So it's these kind of things, I think, the extra meetings could help. I agree with uh, Mr. Cyber that maybe a Saturday. We've done that before over in the, in the library when we were doing the strategic plan. Um, to spend some spend some time uh, at a different kind of a meeting than at a regular council meeting to, to think our way through these kind of things. The other thing, you know, Mr. Zorn was up there tonight saying, you know, we got some condos that we don't know what to do with. And I know that uh, we're going to put them on the market, but uh, should we think, it's these kind of things I think we need to think our way through. When is that open house on those condos? Jim? I don't know. It's supposed to be an open house. I think it, I think it might be this week.
So if you could just tell me what you want, I'd be more than happy to add it.
Bring all your world hands. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, you want to change the, on October? Cal on the 1st, Cal on the 15th, 
and then move the regular to the 29th. Is that okay? You did hear that these are on the calendar, so everything's going to be off on the calendar now. Um, it is anyway, so. Uh, could you repeat hmm? October? Um, what time? Would you repeat October? Cal on the 1st, Cal on the 15th, regular on the 29th. Um, if, if I, if Why nothing on the 22nd? <coughs> Well, somebody said they wanted to move the 27th. Oh, okay. If there is any way we could keep the regular on the 27th, we are in a presidential election, and that's one week before. Which, which month 22nd. are you talking about? 22nd. If we could keep the regular meeting the 22nd, 22nd, if you remember four years ago, right. we were servicing over 1,000 people yeah, in our calendar. Thank you. So. We're back to regular on the 22nd. Yeah. yeah. Thank right. you. Are you now again? The regular stays over to adding a column the 15th of October. Of October. Yeah, on the 15th, the regular stay on the 22nd, the purpose of the election. November stays today, November 29th. Nothing on the 29th. And then the election, we have the election stage, so that's, uh, do we want to do anything on a Tuesday? Mm -hmm. We have two meetings in November. So normally when we do, after it's a, uh, there's a Monday holiday and we have a meeting on Tuesday. No, even if you do the agenda, or there's no way, there's no way to make a pattern. We'll be able to do oh, because of the election? Yeah. Well, what about, um, so someone else can do it. Well, yeah. no, we might. Well, uh, Steve, that one, November, the Steve has been. Because yeah. the very, yeah. the very yeah. election. We could, we could add if we have to. I mean, there, there's going to be an exception here and there. The problem with that, I would not recommend doing it if um, the city administrator or staff goes to the NLC. There is no one here to prepare it because NLC is the 29th. This is December. I know, but November 29th is when we would have to prepare the packet. There might not be anyone here for us. Oh, I see. The, the NLC conference is yeah. the, week the week before. Right, it runs right into that. That's why we moved it. Well, we have to have a 
I think where we get in trouble is that some people we respond to and some people we don't. Mm. I think the council should have a policy that, you know, because people bring to the person, most of the time we don't know the answer. But Jim, and, and I, I can't tell you what to do, it's just a recommendation. Um, you have a city administrator, you usually have staff members there. And if it is an issue, usually the city, it, you, the president usually refers to you. And you have someone that can take them and if it's about a crack road or about a road or a sign. And someone there could take care of it. But we, to me, we, we, we set ourselves up. When some people come to that and we'll respond to it, but someone else comes up and we don't. And when we say we don't have to respond, but when you start responding to some, mm -hmm. it seems like you're singling these people out. So I, I just... I don't see it that way. I know, but yeah. it appears you know, that way. First of all, uh, if Jack were in the room, he'd remind us that uh, sometimes it's better to have a little caution before you respond, mm -hmm. that you need sure. to research something. Mm -hmm. um, I know other bodies, uh, if you ex want a response, you have to put your question We're on the same page. Right. I don't think we in should advance. Be I don't. I don't feel, uh, um, first of all, let's remember, this is a council meeting. It's our right. business meeting. And, of course, the public is encouraged to attend and have their time to speak. But basically, it is our business meeting. We should be controlling the meeting. And we have business to conduct. Um, and people that want to come and vent, that, that's their right. However, we're not, it's not a debate. And we have people who come and want to debate. And, w and that's, that's disruptive to our meeting. Uh, especially when, no matter what you say, it doesn't satisfy uh, those people that want to come and debate. So we, we need to take control of that. Well, I think we're saying the same thing. We can't be inconsistent because it, it singles out. I think the policy, yeah. Brenda, is that you may or may not get a response. You know, if it's, it's a, what day is the, the trash picked up? Um, oh, yes, it's Wednesday in your neighborhood. Fine, simple answer. But uh, when it, uh, something like that. Um, but otherwise, most of those go away, frankly, right? <laughs> because when we get requests, we we look at them during the right. review meeting, mm -hmm. and we say, you know, this looks th this person says they have a road problem. Well, might we give them a call and see if right. we can solve that problem? Okay, um, because you know that way you don't have to inconvenience the person to come in, lay the whole thing out. They still have a problem when they're done. We want to fix the problem. Uh, so a lot of that, a lot of those go away. But <coughs> if you get general indications, uh, you want to speak on, you know, a general topic, uh, then you know we have to probably be consistent. And I think it is well. This is a board of directors <coughs>
leave us to the point that you're unable to speak, that you don't want to marry the person uh, X. You didn't want to but humiliate you, but anybody. No, but you have to you have to give consideration to the staff that's going to be here. I understand that. You've got to give consideration to the business people that are here. You can't. I, I, I you understand know, you're that. Balancing it. But but you know, uh, the resident head is much right as the business person. I just, I just think that it should come after public hearings because it's, it's, uh, you've got a lot of people there, including residents, but, but that want to speak. Yeah. And so you're thinking of the okay. mass. Can I, can I say something? There is also the, the chair has the authority to recognize somebody earlier if they have a situation that pertains to something really well, just oh, right. So we we all we all do, but the chair can the chair can put some put somebody out of order if there's something really important. As long as the rest of the council agrees. Uh no the Yeah, as long as the rest of the council agrees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, two thirds. I don't think so. Well, the um, Miss Attorney, would you please clarify that one way or the other? Okay, what is exactly what the question? <laughs> whether the whether the chairperson has the authority to say <laughs> something unfettered, out of out of order. Oh, you're not talking about recognizing a person. You're talking out. Of, you're not talking about an agenda item out of order. No. Recognizing a person. Mm -hmm. Well, in general, the council president can recognize somebody or a majority of council. Or the majority oh, of council. Yeah, so the majority of council can also overrule a president or the chairperson. Mm, I don't think it's so. No, it says either the council president can recognize or a majority of council. So if the council president was not inclined to recognize somebody, a majority of council could then decide. So it only works one way, it doesn't work both ways? Well, <laughs> I mean, a majority of council, I guess, I mean, it, it, it the doesn't rule. become a, a real problem, but if it's, a, if it's a rule, it ought to be a uh, even handed rules. Majority of council can always change the rules. It's their rules. Okay. It's the current rules. I think we're saying the same thing. Yes, as you probably are. You make sure you have not been
if I say something that to respond to someone at the at, at the microphone, and I can because I, I because I can, but I then I become sort of the official answer to the council, and I don't think that's really a prudent way to run the I, business. I agree with you, and and I uh, I agree to what you're saying. It, uh, Sid had a concern, and what I'm pointing out to Sid, <coughs> he feels uh, sometimes I wish people would not respond. Yes. You know, uh, I mean, I would choose not to respond, but other people, they feel they must say something. And that's everybody's right. Yeah. yeah. I'm just saying, prudent management says there are some things you really shouldn't answer because right. it'll dig a deeper, deeper hole for you. Right. And as Jack has told us many times, you know, it's in court. It's yeah. it's there's another side to the story. Uh, we should be more measured before we go on record right. uh, of saying something. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, recently we had a woman that came with a, a list of complaints. Wow, was there another side to that story? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. she painted um, this whole thing how she was being picked on, and, you know, the truth was um, sh she really glossed over. Uh, all of all her own failings, sure. uh, and I think it would have been very inappropriate for us to have said anything uh, when we didn't know sure. um, the other side of the story. I think when something is brought up and you say we, we should have told you not to answer that, there must be an answer to everything, but a time limit. When it could be answered. Yeah, there are some there are some things that can be answered by the next day. There are some things that Any time, may but take some time. We have to understand and we have to tell them we will answer you. Yeah, I don't have any problem with that. But some things cannot be, just like yeah. Sam said, if it's legal, if there's something going and, on. And uh, I'm taking a vote from the council not to not to answer or not to allow something to happen is wrong. Who said anything about that? Me. <laughs> well, nobody else said anything well, about I taking a vote to. I'm going to give you an example. When I questioned the shooting of the dog, I wanted to know where they were shot. You, as president at the time, got a vote from the council that you can't tell me. No, wh what we took the vote was that we were satisfied with the report that I came in. I wasn't. Okay. And you should have answered me. I should have gotten an answer, and I didn't. And we had when we. Day. The only answer I got is no. You can't know it. No, no there's a full report. Yeah. You? I never there's saw the full report. report. Yeah, we had. I it. asked for it. We had a full report. No. Yeah. The report doesn't state. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not going to argue no, that. But one day I'm going to get the answer. Hmm. And nobody's going to tell me to take a vote to give me an answer. Madam President, now, sorry. Go ahead. Well, yeah, no, it was previously mentioned that we have an inconsistent policy, or at least an inconsistent way that we respond to people, but we have an inconsistency of people who come before us, an inconsistent, uh, you know, sometimes we can't respond and sometimes we can. I mean, that the people have elected us individually to use our best discretion, and sometimes that best discretion is to not say anything. So I don't think we should govern over one another to say, you know, on this particular instance, all of us can talk, and on this particular instance, you know, nobody should talk. And we, we can use our best discretion. People want us here to do that, so. No, an answer should be given every time. And if you, and if you in, in a particular instance, feel that you're, you were using your discretion to ask the question, I, I would encourage it, you know? Okay. I think we can all do that. And that's not being done. Okay, can, can we get back to the point of what we're going to do for the meeting? Do we want to just leave it like we discussed with the, uh, the chair kind of after the public hearing? I'm talking about the regular meetings. So we, we let this, do we need to vote on this? I guess is what I'm asking. Do we want to vote on it? Do we need to vote on it? If you're changing the format and on the televised meetings, you're moving the communications portion now to after from the beginning to after, after the public, public hearing, hearing, I think you should vote on that. Okay. In that section. There may not be any, but it would be after the section. After the section of the public hearing. Right. Which is after the consent agenda. Well, after the public hearing, or a, I mean, or, or, or a site plan, right before council? Because after public hearing comes site plan. Yeah. 
and you could have people there. So, so it should be right before council if they're going to. And if people want to, if people want to speak about an issue, they're there to talk about you know, well, the public thing. That's different. different. But they're supposed to talk about that subject, not about other subjects that some have. So it would be after the public hearing. And after and the site plan. After the site plan. Before council. Before council. Oh, that sounds good. Before council. That sounds appropriate to me. Okay. Do we want to just get a consensus? Or do we want to take a vote? Well, I think she told us twice. Well, well, you can't. Well, you wouldn't <laughs> take uh, formal action tonight, though. That's formal action. Well, Unless you never vote that. Why don't we? Myron, would you move? Will it get me out of here sooner? <laughs> 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 Please. I find an an immediate need to act to move the the. To, to move the to move the communications uh, to a different location in our agenda. I have a motion by Mr. Frazier as part of this committee uh, to invoke the rule 10. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Now I'm, I move that we move the communications portion of our agenda from the beginning to following the site plan in our agenda, site plan area in our agenda. Uh, for the regular meeting. Yes. You will be announcing that there has been a change publicly at the time. Mm -hmm. So the residents will hear. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and I also recommend that it goes on the website.
w when you say things, you have to be accountable. If those things are not true, uh, there is civil liability for, for defamation. But, but an employee isn't going to sue somebody uh, more than likely. I, I just, to me, it's, it's unfair. Um, I, we agree. Um, especially in that forum. Mm -hmm. And there are other ways to um, air grievances. We have a city administrator. Uh, there's a, a something in, you know, you put something in writing, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a complaint. But to go into a public forum and uh, read out somebody, um, I, 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 they can't defend themselves, and, um, you know, I, I just um, be very, very uncomfortable with it. Uh, it's like being a bully. Yeah. It's when it's repeated, you know, when it's repeated, it becomes um, it's a repeat of accusation. And it's, it's, it's repeated with it has some <coughs> character and behavior over and over and over again. Um, that's a definition of character. That bothers me a lot. I think it's character. It's cruel. And with no proof. I, I know well, other public... I know another public time that is when they announced that this is a public communication piece, they asked, we ask that you refrain from naming this one. At least you ask. You try that. You can't enforce it because of, but you do ask. You could ask. Out of, out of the um, courtesy and yeah. respect, yeah. Yeah. just ask talk that you not issue. name the employee, talk, talk about the issue. Uh, so I think at minimum we should do that. We can do that. That, that whole little yeah, piece. Yeah, I will. I will. Good suggestion. Anyone else? Anyone else? Go ahead. I got okay. other business. Than I am. Oh, so you said anyone else. I didn't. Oh, I, so I thought what you meant that. Well, I just think before we get too far um, off the agenda, the I, can, I can't hear you now. Okay, the communication portion. Did we decide are we going to move it for the committee to hold it and also no. leave it with well, yeah. that? No. Okay, thank you. That's a good discussion of the chair. Okay. Thank you. I have a couple of emails that I got. Um, one of them came from, it was about the McDonald's Tower Card Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the, the person that wrote this complained about the jigsaw puzzle being. being Lost or disappeared. That's not really what they're complaining about. You know, the the tail the tail end of the thing is, mm -hmm. I think, their real c concern. The jigsaw puzzle was just the straw that broke the camel's back, and that is, it says we put up with a sewer smell coming from the restrooms and the ceiling lighting coming and going from our on to dim. We can't seem to get anyone to fix these problems. We put up with a smelly lobby and filthy elevators. Is there a reason why the microwave can't be replaced? Um, and then it goes back to the puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd like this item returned to us. It is the monetary value, but the social networking of this activity that is priceless. But we've gone over this over and over to complaints at McDonald Towers that don't seem to be uh, handled. And um, I think we need to do something. Can I uh, speak to that? Yeah. Oh, I'm um, as um, I've served for the last year, I've served on the nonprofit housing board, and um, one of the things we are moving towards is a resident advisory group to air some of these things, um, just to field complaints within the building. Um, I'm over there with Fred, uh, and sometimes Jim, um, fairly regularly. I have yet to see a dirty elevator. I don't, I'm not aware of any smell in the, I uh, see the soil furniture in the lobby that was replaced. Um, uh, the lights are being addressed that we have, um, uh, we've just done a, a review of architects and uh, the energy, um, I've also moved towards an energy uh, audit of McDonald's Power. Park Place. Uh, so we are 
addressing those, and there is money in the um, maintenance reserve account for this. Mm -hmm. so we're not talking city budget or anything like that. Um, but we're moving uh, on these things. Well, since you're the uh, coordinator, I mean, you're the representative on that board, maybe you could talk to this person. I was find planning to do that. Okay. I was planning to find, <coughs> out, uh, find out the other half of the story. Yeah, the other half of the story. And, um, you know, we, we've really talked a lot about in this uh, nonprofit board, which has been rejuvenated with uh, um, some really very fine additions mm -hmm. to the committee. Um, and we've talked a lot about um, uh, having a, uh, a more resident feedback and responding to, to resident issues and, um, and complaints um, and looking at security and trying to get more of a, a free to core of there <coughs> that it's more of a neighborhood. Um, and uh, uh, we've even talked about a self of standards that, um, like Gary would say that, um, but that this is sh this these apartments shouldn't be any different than any other neighborhood in the city. I mean, as far as the quality of life sure. of the people in it. And, sure. and um, especially when we are sitting on a, a, a enough money to make the repairs, um, we're, we're moving that direction. I don't know if, Fred, you want to add anything, but you get on all the points. I know about three or four, four years ago. Like the architect. We've, we've interviewed an architectural firm. Seventeenth. Uh, hopefully they'll yeah, we're gonna improve our right on seventeenth for architect. Okay. I know about three or four years ago they they did have a group of folks there that had a whole list of things they wrote down and, mm -hmm. and came to the council to complain about. So yeah. yeah. But won't they feel a little bit uh exactly mm -hmm. uh their concerns? Are we making sure that they can verbally express their concerns and not feel in retaliation from the apartment manager? I think we're doing there. that. Um, one of my former students, I didn't, that's the housing expert, Larry Fizio. He's a Southfield high grad. He's the chair. Yeah, um, the chair. Uh, um, Mrs. Beatty, who's uh, a resident. Um, um, Michael Martin, uh, who's got the accounting background, who does a lot of the review of the reports that are submitted to the state. Uh, Gil Silverman and uh, Mike Barish. So we have we have uh, some newer people on the on and we have Rita Hillman. Oh, I'm sorry, Rita. Uh, she's a former Fannie Mae executive. Uh, serves on the I think it's the Michigan Housing Nonprofit Network. They provide financing to uh, housing uh, community development projects. I served on that committee for two terms, and I know all about the complaints. They were notorious. I, I couldn't get a thing done, as you're talking now, from the manager. The council told me we don't own the building. When Fred came in, we there was we started to do a little bit investigating and still nothing happened for a long time and I got frustrated and fed up with it of what was happening to the people in the McDonald Tower and the others. I'm surprised to hear that you're speaking well of things are being done. They're not being done yet. It's, it's the same thing. thing that I did which never, never took fruit because it stopped by the manager or we do nothing. It's the same thing. We're doing nothing. So I got out of it. Too much frustration, too much stress, and everything. And I still get called. I tell them to call you. That's <laughs> 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 just that bathroom. That's all they have to do is put a bucket of water in there, and the tap is probably dried out. Okay. Give me a dry water. When did it always happen? I have another one. Another email that came that's. <coughs> this has to do with problems over at Davida Woods. Uh, uh, this lady said that she's concerned because there are, she goes to the, uh, she was on her way to do her laundry and there were folks hanging out there that that she felt threatened. 
so she went back to her house. She called the police. Police did come over, but uh, uh, she says that you know they whoever it is they keep hanging around. So uh, I don't know if Jim, if the police ought to do some things over there or not. Or I can I can answer. I live there, and when my son goes down to do the laundry, our laundry, impossible. Because you've got people who keep their wash in the machine, and you can't touch it to take it out for hours and hours and hours. Uh, even even management can't do anything about it. It's the caliber of the people who live there. Oh, I go to law school, you know, we sit down. I don't mean use the machines in my complex. And uh, there are a lot of teens involved in the work. I drove up today, and they've been walking in the roadway. They don't get out of the roadway. So I slow down and wait until they decide to move over. My car is scratched up. My car that was stolen, you should have seen the scratches in the key or whatever they were using to scratch my car. It was impossible. So I don't know if we need to have a, any kind of a special effort to, to work with the management over there. Or we'll work with them. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what our flexibility is, you know, to monitor it on a regular basis rather than respond to reports that come from there. So. He has security and the gate wasn't working right. I couldn't get the gate to be open. And the guard, the secure guy, was sitting in his car with the lights on, didn't come out. And the cars were lined up outside the 11 mile. Danger, danger. He didn't come out. So they made a, uh, an opening little road to run around again. Then I went past the gate. Let him stop me. At that time, and I told him, uh, it's the uh, not management. It's I don't know who to blame. Uh, management is doing everything there they could that night. I know that. Well, but I just know I got the email. And yeah, well, it seemed like true. a area for concern. Uh, I brought this. I'm sorry. I brought this up at another meeting, and I was um, asked that we get a briefing on the um, status of apartment inspection. What? How many do we do a year? What do we do? Um, as far as fire, uh, everything. I guess it's a full process. What can we do based on our present work? How often are we doing that? And if we aren't doing it, then the council needs to really um, make, make a... Uh, we, we go through this, this, this drill a few times, I know, since I've been on council mayor about apartment inspection. And we're told that we have the right to inspect those. And um, we've had a, a number of uh, complexes that we have been made aware of the condition by the people living there. And I can guarantee you that if it, there was no inspection. If there was, there was no follow-up to it. And the minute we are made aware, we make it an issue, then there are citations and there's visits. But we are told that we have an inspection ordinance on the record. And my major concern is that we have some very old apartment structures and these out of town, they have gone to bankruptcy, these out of town buyers have bought them, never set foot in them. They're not making investments in them, they're just a cash cow and that is unacceptable. If we don't get our handle on this, we're going to have some blight in our city that is going to be astronomical. And my concern is that if we do, if we inspect, and we always get caught up in this discussion about we don't want people going in their apartment. I'm not really, that's not my issue. If you 
We have doors hanging off the hinges. We have landscaping. We have leaking roof. We have carpet that is reeking of odor. And if we just inspected the common area, we will have fulfilled um, what I feel we need to do as a city. And you know, those those apartment owners, and we've had <coughs> meetings on it, if apartment owners who will maintain the common area will pretty much, you can guarantee, are maintaining the other parts of the building. If they paint it, keep the gutters up, keep the doors on, make sure the buildings are painted, make sure the property is right. I would be very hard pressed to say that's all we're going to do. Keep the landscaping up and just ignore the, the units on the inside. So we, we've, got, we've got to be more good. This is one of the things we talk about, things we need to talk about. You know, we need to talk about this. This is not um, just all well discussion. This is serious. As hard as we are on code enforcement for homes, we need to be just as fierce about code enforcement. These are people's homes. And the one, the last building that we had, this someone told me at a beauty salon that this apartment had this. I said, "You're absolutely stupid. You're not talking about Southfield." So I personally went. She said, "You can walk right in because the door is broken." Sure, she said, "Door hanging off the end, just walk right in." It was awful, awesome. and that she was paying eight hundred dollars a month. Can you I, say which one it is? Yes, it was. Um, which one was it? Um, Garden View, yes. That's been a problem for what? I, I hope it hasn't been this bad. But then the it's other thing, been a problem for a long time. On, the, on, the, on the south side of the city, a number of these buildings were built with that underground park. Almost all of them have a strain or something going across. What, what is our ordinance? Is office building? No, these are apartment buildings. It's the parking is underground? Yes. Like oh, yeah. oh, yes. oh yes. yes, Providence no, Towers. Well, the big ones, it's the big ones. Yeah. yeah, they had the under and almost all of them are roped off because for some reason, either I don't know why, and they're just collecting dust. So what is our ordinance? What what, what, is, what did you say was in there? It's just roped off. It's just roped off, and so it's a dark dungeon area. You know, when we had the other building we showed up, they were storing they were storing stolen cars. We had to throw them out. It's a safety issue. It's a safety issue. And then when you go to the office well building. That's a problem for code. That's a problem for the city. Yes, but we, we have the responsibility to make sure it happens. And then the other one is the, the office building in Northland Towers. Oh, my goodness. I went under there. It's, it's, it's debris falling. It, it's Northland Towers, the, the office building, the medical building area. There is an underground parking in there. I mean, what what are we going to do? We're just going to let them put a string across it and just let it be taken? It's, it's, to me, if you're not going to use it, it should be restricted. Greenfield and Nine Mile. If, 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 these, if they're not going to use this, there'll be something that should seal it off. So it's not accessible. It's dangerous. And those are the type of things that I say. When we were talking about the South of Sand, that's not the South of Sand. And we should be on that. And whoever is responsible for it, that's why I want to bring that. I want to know. It's in the Cornerstone District. It is, but it's the well, city of Southfield. They don't have code enforcement. That's not their <coughs> job. Code enforcement They're is a long time. They're autonomous. They're in charge of that district. Get them to do something about it. Well, Sid, if it's getting them to do something, we need to find a way to make them do it. I'm just saying it's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. And you have children in those Call buildings, the and people yeah. coming and going unrestricted. Mm -hmm. And you got this dungeon, dark dungeon that's just open. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No, the apartment building. Mm -hmm. The apartment mm -hmm. building. You have them in both. They wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't be
and there was discussion. Where should it, should it be? Should it just be the city center across the street? Should it be along the telegraph corridor? Should it be the whole city? And then we discovered we had two more licenses that were given back to the city that the Liquor Control Commission never told us about. Um, one was the establishment on Evergreen and 12 Mile, and I think the other one was Hibachi. Mm -hmm. We left the country and it came back. So because they did not notify us, they, they informed us in June, and actually it was zero who came to apply for a license. We told them we had no more licenses. He went up to the state and he said, what can I do? Because I'm interested in putting liquor in my establishment, and that's when they told him there's two licenses available to the city. So, so they, they said, you, so they, so they gave us the two licenses back. back. However, with the population or the census count, and because the population went down, we basically lost four licenses. So even though they gave us two, we would have lost four. But they said as long as you can get these approved before the commission approves the census count, you're going to be okay. Historically, it should have been done in August. For some reason, it didn't occur until November 22nd of this year. They notified, they sent a letter November 28th, 29th. We got it like the Friday when we came back in the new year that we lost the license. So then we were going back and forth that it wasn't fair. They were going to be coming before council. We submitted paperwork to the Liquor Control Commission. They were going to hold a hearing. The chairman wasn't available, so they tabled it until today. And that's when we found out at 3 o'clock today that they said, no, these were two licenses that were originally given, and we're not going to honor it. So they took it back. So we're, so right now that long story, yeah, we're, <laughs> well, we're still was eligible, or still liable to lose three more licenses? No, we have no licenses left. But but you, if, you're if, they come, they come if they come back, they'll, they'll disappear. We won't be able to reassign them. Well, that's a good question. I don't, that I don't well, you said that we were supposed I, to lose four. I, I'll have to check to see on that one. I, that's a good question. Right now, I would say we have none, and if some, I don't know if any more will come back. I don't know that. I'll have to research it. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Do you know what's going on at the Liquor Control Commission? Is uh, Nada Simona, she's out. No, she's out. Yeah. There is a new... And the um, new guy that's coming in, that came in, is charging exorbitant fees to Ceros, who we gave a license to. Every Monday, they send them a bill for something else. Well, there's, a, there's the a new board. director, and it seems like the new board, they're just not very cooperative. Usually they work with the community. But they're giving him such a hard time. <coughs> Why? It, it's a whole brand new board, and they're not willing to budge on their rules and their way of doing business, so I don't know. They but they send the bill. It's got to be this, got to be this. So far, a couple of thousand dollars. And he's got to work on his, you know, building up, doing what he has to do. Wow, it's getting so... I don't know. They can't exist. Okay, anyway. All right, Quick. Quick. Partner, have a good one. Be safe. Are you are you letting me do it in my pocket? No. Is that close? Is that close? No. 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 Everybody that was here tonight did.